Minister, good morning. Welcome to Indian News Link Hard Talk, Talk Series. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And um, you handle a number of important portfolios, which people of New Zealand look forward to knowing more about. So shall we start with an opening statement from you? Thanks, Venkat. It's, it's great to be uh, on Hard Talk with you. In many ways, you know, as a minister, I'm in the hot seat. Uh, transport yep. and housing, two yep. of the issues that I'm responsible uh, for in the government, uh, uh, two of the biggest political issues of our time. Right. People want solutions. And, uh, and so that's my responsibility to, to lead what is a pretty extensive reform program in the way that we build our cities, our neighbourhoods and our homes. Right. And uh, in the first 12 months of this coalition government, um, we've got some real runs on the board, I think. We've, uh, we stopped the government's privatisation of public housing. <clears throat> and, uh, and we're now investing about $4 billion uh, to, to increase the total stock of state housing by 6,500 homes yep. uh, over the next uh, three years. So that's well underway. And... Um, we're also investing more than ever before in tackling the problem of homelessness. Yep. You know, for the last three winters, we've had the worst homelessness, successively worse in each of the last three winters. So we're pulling out all the stops to make sure that we don't have families living in cars and garages. Um, we are building uh, affordable homes for first home buyers through the Kiwi Build program. Yep. This is really significant because uh, uh, no government in the last 40 years has worked directly with private sector developers and builders to ensure that uh, affordable, modest homes for young families are built. So we, do, we started from a, from a standing start. Um, uh, we've got, uh, I think, 47 houses completed uh, we have some 4,000 houses under contract that have been, uh, we're, uh, we've contracted with developers to produce those houses. And we've got a number of very large scale developments building you know, whole new suburbs and communities uh, with another 10,000 Kiwi built houses planned for those big developments. So that's one of our um, really big projects. Minister, the, um, one of your colleagues this morning, um, Chris Hipkins has said that the Kiwi build has been incredibly slow and that uh, although he's very hopeful of it. Mm. Do you think something has gone wrong from what you thought it would be? Because your promise prior to election was something else, that you would build 1,000 houses in the first year and so on and so forth. Uh, what do you think has gone wrong, Minister? Well, um, we have had a few teething problems in the first early months for Kiwi Build. Um, what we're trying to do is change the way an industry operates. You know, our residential development industry is based on a business model of building expensive houses and relatively small numbers of them. Yeah. Um, and what we're trying to do with Kiwi Build through a, a number of different levers is to really incentivize developers instead to build more houses and more affordable homes. Mm. You know, fewer than 5% of the new homes being built in New Zealand are in that bottom 25% of the price range. Yeah. That's the affordable range where first home buyers will have a crack at, at getting their own home. And uh, we are constantly refining and changing the program uh, in order to try and get results. But, you know, it's like turning around a super tanker. No government has attempted this in the last 40 years. And did you not know what you were up to, uh, up against, when uh, you thought of all these and made the promises? Um, because you seem to be mm. now committed to numbers mm. and um, you need to have, you need to step up so that you're able to be credible in what uh, you're saying and what you're doing. Sure. So we, we have committed to some numbers. So we've said we're going to build 100,000 affordable homes over the next 10 years. Yep. We're going to ramp it up over these first three years. We never said that we would immediately build 10,000 homes a year. Um, so... Uh, uh, we, there's a couple of things we have to do. You know, one is we've got to build affordable homes immediately. Yep. But secondly, we have to tackle the underlying causes of the housing crisis. That's just as important because if we don't tackle um, the basic market dysfunction, that means that Auckland, a small city by global standards, has some of the most expensive housing and expensive land in the world yep. relative to local incomes. 
So we have to tackle those underlying uh, causes. They are, for example, uh, that we have a broken system for financing infrastructure. Yeah. Now we're well on the way to bringing in a new system of financing infrastructure that uses bond finance, private investment in the drains, the water, uh, stormwater, wastewater, all of the infrastructure that you need to turn farmland into urban land with housing. And uh, we'll be bringing legislation to the parliament in the next few months to set up that new system of financing infrastructure. We're also working on some changes under the Resource Management Act to free up the planning rules that currently stop our city growing. Mm. So um, we'll be providing direction from central government to councils, uh, telling them uh, some of things they can and cannot do in their district plans, because we want our cities to be able to grow up. Yep. You know, in a city like Auckland, uh, there's huge potential for us to build, to use land more efficiently, to uh, build more apartments, townhouses, terraces. Uh, you know, all cities of any scale around the world do this, but in New Zealand, we're very slow coming to the party. So we're going to make some of those changes within the RMA that will free up the planning rules. And we're also working with Auckland Council on how we can allow the city to grow more. In the south of Auckland, for example, there's massive potential to grow. Yes. And we're working on how we can extend uh, modern electric commuter rail to some of those communities in, this, in the southern part of the city and allow the city to grow. Because we know that if we don't build good transport infrastructure, yep. you're creating simply handing a legacy of dysfunction and congestion and gridlock to the next generation. So getting that link between transport and housing is critical. Two things here, Minister. One is said that you would convert a lot of farmland into urban land. How would that uh, interfere with our uh, Department of Conservation and our green and uh, clean uh, environment? How is that challenge uh, being addressed? So we come at this from two angles. One is that uh, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of public uh, very concerned that we protect the high quality growing soils that we have. Yes. Around, for instance, around Pukekohe in the south of uh, Auckland. And um, the Auckland Unitary Plan actually currently protects those growing soils perfectly adequately. But we're looking at strengthening the, the law under the Resource Management Act um, to give councils the mandate to protect those growing soils because for generations to come, we want to be able to grow good, healthy food close to our communities. But, you know, anybody who's flown over this country and looked down knows that uh, we have plenty of land in New Zealand. Yep. There isn't a shortage of land, but we have highly restrictive planning rules that stop our city from growing. When you stop the city from growing, you simply drive up the price of land and therefore the price of housing. So we must find a planning system that is, allows the city to grow, it's more responsive to demand, while also doing good quality planning that protects the things that people value, like our beaches, our rivers, our bush. And So you're hoping that by the middle of the year you would have a, a comprehensive plan in place to, uh, to do all these things that you're uh, hoping to do? In the next 12 months, uh, we will have unveiled a new system for financing infrastructure that allows private investment in the building of the infrastructure you need for urban growth. Um, we will have taken to the parliament direction under the RMA to free up the planning rules that currently stop the city from growing up. So that was uh, a lip service done by the previous government that they said they, they said they would reform the RMA. They had nine years. Mm. They never did it. We offered, if, we said to them, if you, if you change the RMA to make housing more affordable, we'll support it. They, okay. never, they never took up that offer. So, and David Parker, the Environment Minister, is working now on a broader, more fundamental reform of the RMA to allow it to uh, allow us to solve some of these problems of urban growth as well. Minister, so as for when you announced Kiwi Build, I understand that you had uh, an overwhelming response from uh, builders and contractors and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I understand there were as many as 40,000 people uh, throughout the country who applied for pre-qualification. Is that right? No, for, about 45,000 people have signed up on the KiwiBuild website saying, we're interested in KiwiBuild, please keep us informed and tell us more. So, so you, you have uh, shortlisted all of them and you have selected those whom you want to work with? 
No, these are these are people who would like to be first home buyers, who would like to buy a key. Oh, okay, okay. Not not the builders themselves. No, we have a separate uh, uh, channel where we're working directly with builders. You know, one of, the, one of the things that we want to do with the construction industry is help it to become more productive. Mm. We have a very inefficient building industry in New Zealand. We build houses. You know, a couple of guys out in the paddock building a house from scratch, piece by piece. Correct. Yeah, we need to build uh, houses in a more modern and efficient way. And we've been talking uh, with investors and construction companies, both in New Zealand and overseas, about how we can build homes and factories using digital uh, production techniques. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the Scandinavians do this extensively, Correct. the North Americans. Why should we let them have all the fun? One of the big opportunities with Kiwi Builders then, uh, when we can contract work, thousands of new homes every year for multiple years, that's an opportunity to do something we've never done in New Zealand before, and that's invest in the technology and say, a factory, for example, that could build 3,000 homes a year, ship them onto the site and put them up in days right. rather than months. And Stephen Tyndall, the, the uh, so Stephen was, uh, founded the warehouse. Yeah, he, he was our lecture. Uh, he you couldn't come last year. He he was our Saran and Sith Indian Muslim lecture. He was speaking about it. Right. So he's working closely with us on this, mm -hmm. and uh, he's a great believer that Kiwi Build is an opportunity to do what we've never been able to do in New Zealand, and that's aggregate the supply and build in bulk in order to drive down costs. Are you able to work closely with the Minister of Immigration to address the shortage uh, of labour um, in terms of skilled labour for Kiwi Bill? We are. We, I mean, we've always said that as we fine-tune our immigration policy, mm -hmm. uh, nothing we do will constrict or restrain the ability of the construction industry to get the workers that it needs. So, is, he, is he supportive of your idea? Yes, he is. And we've put in place measures already to make it easier for the construction companies to get the labour that they need. Okay. You know, um, successive governments have never invested properly in our workforce, training up people to... Immigration itself has not been properly handled in, in many people's view. Mm. It's, uh, it's, it's not been given the due importance that it deserves, especially for a country like New Zealand. Yeah. Um, Minister, uh, I just want to ask you how affected you are with this Stephen Barclay episode. Well, I would rather it hadn't have happened. You know, Stephen Barclay was recruited to head up Kiwi Build and oversee the Kiwi Build program. And uh, for the last two months, there's been an employment dispute uh, between the chief executive of the ministry uh, and Mr. Barclay. And uh, uh, from you my, as the minister couldn't intervene? No, it's, um, it would be quite wrong for me to do that. I don't recruit public servants. I don't yeah. manage them. They're not accountable to me. The only person who is accountable to me is the chief executive of the right. ministry. Yeah. And I've refrained from commenting publicly about this employment dispute for legal reasons. Yeah. Because if I did comment publicly, um, it, it would have, uh, it would risk unfairly prejudicing Mr. Barclay's position or the government's position. I wouldn't want you to do that, Minister, but what I want to know is, New Zealanders would like to know, how far is the Kiwi Bill program mm. affected by the exit of uh, the Kiwi Bill chief exit? Well, let's put it this way, it hasn't been helped by. Okay. Mm. Mm. So, look, we, we just want to get on with the business of building affordable homes, and we're pulling out all the stops to do that. You know, we are... Um, so you're appointing a successor? Uh, a new leadership is being put in place for the Kiwi Build program. Is it uh, a stopgap arrangement, or is it a full full time? No, there'll be a there'll be a permanent uh, head of the unit. Okay. that will be appointed. But look, the work is Kiwi Build is a lot bigger than one person, and uh, the work is continuing. We are we're going to be announcing in the coming uh, couple of months the plans for the uh, Unitex site in Mount Elm, yes. where we're looking to build a showcase urban community there with more than 3,000 new homes. Uh, it's going to be something new in New Zealand, a, a, a contemporary urban eco-community 
um, with a level of density that we haven't seen in, in um, New Zealand's typical suburban. It's quite an exciting program, uh, the Unitech one. Yeah, Very. yeah, it is. And uh, you know, a lot of the work last year uh, was laying the foundations for the establishment of a new urban development authority. Yeah, this is a new government agency which is going to lead these large-scale projects, like the one at Unitech. And uh, our plan is to have twelve or fifteen of these large-scale projects operating. That should be about three thousand houses yeah each of those projects could probably deliver 500 homes a year um, and so that these projects are going to deliver much of the volume uh, of Kiwi built homes but they will be each of those projects will be a mix of public housing Kiwi built affordable housing a combination and homes for the open market okay with, with high quality urban design and great transport connections so. Minister you are in charge of transportation and you know more than any other minister, the horrendous experience that people have in Auckland. You must be, it must be a nightmare for you to drive from the airport to the Um How far, how is it that we have not invested enough in a basic infrastructure like uh, transportation in, New Zealand, in, in Auckland? So the first thing is we haven't invested enough for a long, long time. Yeah. But the second thing is that uh, we've made the wrong kinds of investment. Mm. Auckland, uh, 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 as a legacy of the last 60 years of transport policy, has systematically underinvested in public transport and built a transport system that's entirely dependent on motorways and roads and the private car. Yeah. That's why we have one of the highest rates of car ownership in the world, because there has been no decent public transport alternative. Yeah. And I think anybody who's travelled, uh, anybody who's, who's worked internationally, knows that a modern city of any scale has to have public transport alongside the roads and motorways in order for it to function effectively. This city, is in, uh, our country's biggest city, is losing $1.3 billion every year in lost productivity uh, because of congestion on the roads. So uh, our plan is to turn this around. And so uh, Phil Goff, the mayor, and I last year unveiled a $28 billion fully funded 10-year plan of investments in transport infrastructure. And uh, this year, we're going to be rolling out those projects. It's a mixture of roads and motorways, of more public transport uh, services, more walking and cycling, uh, and it's designed to retrofit the city away from 50 years of car dependency. We have to get people out of single occupant vehicles and give them genuine alternatives. Now, walking and cycling is actually remarkably effective at doing it, and that's why we're investing in cycleways. Um, you've seen the introduction of lime scooters on Correct. the streets. People are hungry for alternatives. Uh, to sitting in the traffic and sitting in the motorway for hours on end. It's so unproductive. It's a terrible waste, not only from an economic point of view, but from people's quality of life as well. So the first thing is to improve and increase the frequency of public transport services in our city right now, and we're doing that. The second is to build infrastructure that will allow a quantum leap forward in the, in the quality of public transport infrastructure. We are implementing the City Rail Link, which will double the number of trains that can run on the rail network and mean that through the, the train stations that serve so many communities, dozens of communities across the city, trains will run as frequently as every few minutes at peak hours. So you're taking away the, the objective of just profitability from these trains. Yes. You want to have more frequency. They're a public service. Yeah. They're an essential piece of infrastructure. The big game changer is the light rail project. And uh, we are um, um, currently designing the light rail lines and the infrastructure. We're working through a procurement... Is it like more like trams on the roads? Think of it more like the London Metro. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so the, there may be elements uh, with light rail. You can, they can be a streetcar like a Melbourne tram. Or like imagine the modern what we used to have in Christchurch. Yeah, but imagine these are these would be modern European or North American style light rail, not old style streetcars, but yeah. sleek, modern, spacious and efficient uh, rail. They have the f versatility; they can run down the middle of the road, share the road with traffic, or they can go underground or above the ground. Right. 
And so, so that would take more than $28 billion if you want to cover the city. Well, our plan is to build two new lines, one from the city to Mangere. Mm. Mangere is obviously the, uh, where the airport is, critical, critical piece of transport infrastructure, but it's also one of the biggest concentrations of jobs in the country. Yeah. And, and this rail line would connect the CBD uh, of Auckland and the Ma and Mangere. Why can't we have a metro minister? Is it all that difficult to run a metro across the country, well, across the city of Auckland? Well, in effect, what we're doing is, is by building these two lines, the city to Mangere and the city out to the northwest, we're adding two lines uh, to the existing heavy rail network, which is a rapid transit network, and the very, very successful northern busway that goes across the Harbour Bridge to the northern suburbs. We haven't, so uh, we're building a rapid transit network that's like, it will be like a metro, and then you have ferries, buses, uh, Uber, taxis, uh, lime scooters, you name it, walking and cycling, that connects uh, people in their neighbourhoods and their homes to the rapid transit network. See, people will remember you for a very, very long time if you can ease the traffic problem, mm. because this is really killing the, the initiatives of people who just don't want to go. You just don't want to go to city. Sure. And you know, businesses, uh, it's common for businesses to have to have twice as many vans yeah. and drivers on staff because of the congestion. Correct. Because it takes so long to drive some goods from one side of town to the other. The third element of the, of the plan is uh, to really defeat Auckland's congestion is uh, pricing. Yep. And uh, we're doing a lot of work. The previous government began it, we're continuing it on, and we've broadened the scope. So look at how we can use pricing as a signal to manage the demand. It's the peak hour demand that's the problem. You know, Auckland's motorway system is beautiful to drive on in the middle of the night, but at four in the afternoon, it's a nightmare. So any time during the day is a nightmare. Yeah. So if we can use pricing to um, smooth off those peaks, some kind of tolling, um, countries all around the world are dealing with oh, yes. We don't have to invent the wheel, reinvent the wheel. Singapore is the most advanced. Uh, they're looking at a satellite and GPS-based uh, pricing system. And the thing that makes this even more imperative now is that we're in the process of electrifying the vehicle fleet. If we're going to okay. meet our, um, our commitment to be carbon neutral by 2050, mm. we have to electrify the fleet. You know, the UK has just announced that there will be no more combustion engine personal yeah. vehicles mm. purchased in the, in the United Kingdom by, uh, after 2040. We're probably going to have to do something similar, and we're working on that right now. Once the vehicle fleet is electric, how are we going to raise the $4 billion that we need every year to fund our transport system? This shouldn't be a problem. Well, currently we get that through petrol tax, Correct. right, yeah. and road yeah. user charges. So we're going to have to get off petrol tax, and the idea of a satellite or GPS-based charging system that charges you by time and distance on the road network, that seems to be the most promising way forward. And, uh, and if we can do that, not only is it a way of raising the revenue we need every year to fund the whole transport system, make petrol taxes redundant, uh, that would also give us the tools to manage demand in our cities so that, for instance, you might pay a $2 toll to use the motorway network in the afternoon. Yeah. Uh, and that would con convince some people, well, you know what, I'll travel later in the evening or earlier in the day, or maybe I'll take my bike or catch the train instead. And people are now increasingly working from homes or the regional offices or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah but transport is equally a big challenge for you. It uh, is, but the two are intertwined, housing and transport. It's really about how do we build successful cities. And I suppose the big underlying themes for me are we have to invest more aggressively. Yeah. We have to spend more money. Uh, not only the government, but we have to be open to private investment uh, in the infrastructure that we need for growth. Uh, the second thing is we've got to do things differently. So we need more intensification. We've got to change the pattern of housing. We've got to get the market to produce more affordable houses. Um, we've got to uh, shift away from the old approaches, which were essentially just build uh, expensive houses and build motorways. That I think you need more apartment types, community living. Yes, we do. Thing. And so, we, you know, the Unitech development that we talked about, uh, it's likely there, for instance, they're going to have a heavy rail station at one end of the development uh, in Mount Albert. At the other end, there'll be a light rail station in Point Chev. 
There are walking and cycling tracks already around the entire yeah. development, a very good bus route down one side of it. Uh, many people who live in that new community, through more than 3,000 dwellings we're going to build, many of them will choose not to own a car, or instead of owning two cars, maybe one car. Right. And so in the apartments that we build there, they won't have their own cars, but car park spaces properly. If they want to buy or lease a car park, they'll be able to, but they won't have to. And that alone when you, can reduce the cost of a new home by $50,000. Easily. Mm -hmm. Now, this um, rail development project in the CBD, is it going according to schedule? Yeah, we've, um, uh, the schedule is fine. There have been one or two hiccups with the procurement, and, uh, but I think they're pretty much sorted out now. The City Rail Link Limited, which is a joint venture of Auckland Council and Central Government, is yeah. doing a very good job of managing it. Uh, and they're producing now, they changed the way the different contractors are engaging with that project to create uh, what's something like an alliance where they, all the contractors come together and they work in a more collaborative and open book way. It's 2020, is it? Uh, it's a little bit later than that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I suppose that it, it would be a model project for the for the country. You might think of similar ones in Wellington. Wellington is also getting congested. It is, and um, uh, Auckland is not our only focus in, in, in yeah, this work. Correct, and yeah. so, in Wellington, in the next in the next uh, couple of months, I expect to be announcing. Once uh, my colleagues in cabinet uh, support me on this, we'll be announcing a major thirty-year transport project in Wellington, which will unleash that city's development, uh, invest in a mix of modern transport uh, projects that will reduce car dependency and congestion, and give that beautiful harbourside urban core of Wellington the opportunity to thrive. You know, it's already a, quite a high density city, but we think it can be much, much better. The plan that you're bringing up for Kiwi Build, um, it, will, it will enhance the affordability of homes. Uh, it will emphasise, rather, to have more homes that, that are affordable. Yeah, we've already in Wellington, uh, for example, we've already announced a, a, a partnership there with um, Ian Castles from the Wellington Property yeah. Company, okay. who are building some very nice apartments uh, for under 400,000 um, right in the city. So, and we, we're looking to do a lot more of that. Excellent. Yeah. Minister, please give a final statement. Thank you, Ben Kat. Uh, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to be on Hard Talk and to uh, outline our priorities for 2019. We're going to continue to roll out Kiwi Build and work with uh, developers and builders around the country in some of the most unaffordable towns and cities to build uh, the modest, affordable homes for, for young first home buyers that the market just has failed to deliver in recent decades. Uh, we're going to build more state housing because we know that there are many people who will struggle in the private rental market and we're going to, over the next three years, deliver an additional 6,500 uh, state houses. We're modernising the rental laws. You know, a third of Kiwis rent and yet our laws are archaic. Uh, we're setting standards to make sure that all rental properties are warm and dry. Uh, and we're rebalancing the responsibilities and uh, rights of both landlords and tenants to encourage more security of tenure and more uh, stable uh, tenancies for people who rent. Uh, we're also tackling the underlying causes of the housing crisis. So uh, we're changing the tax settings to discourage property speculation. Uh, we are um, freeing up uh, the planning rules, working with councils, but giving them firm direction under the Resource Management Act by central government to make sure that their district plans uh, support growth and development, support new housing, uh, and encourage intensification uh, in our cities. Uh, and of critical importance uh, is our plan to, to bring in new ways of financing infrastructure. Uh, the broken system for financing infrastructure has been one of the big roadblocks to urban growth and has driven up the cost of housing. And so by allowing infrastructure bonds, a new way of financing this infrastructure, that's going to really allow our cities to expand and grow. Transport's a vital part of the whole uh, way that we build our cities, and uh, we've changed the priority of our whole transport system to safety. We're investing billions of dollars 
uh, and uh, prioritizing our investments to save lives and prevent serious injuries on the roads. We're looking to um, move more freight instead of by trucks, by rail and coastal shipping. Uh, we think that can be both more efficient and protect our environment. And in our cities, we're on a mission to build modern public transport systems that will give uh, people a genuine alternative to sitting in the traffic stuck in conge on congested motorways and roads by having uh, access to modern, efficient and affordable public transport in our cities.